our speaker today is Greg Howe. And uh, one of the main reasons why we invited him is because of the Urbana Conference. In fact, I would be willing to bet that I am probably the most averrant uh, supporter of Urbana because I've, I bet you I've been to or more Urbanas than any of you in this room <laughs> except for probably Greg. If you beat me, I'll give you, well, I'll take you out for lunch. Seven Urbanas for me. Okay. Well, any, Urbana is a, a wonderful conference. Greg has, is probably the most famous person in Urbana right now because he has been the MC for the last four or five Urbanas. So every student in InterVarsity knows Greg. Greg has been with InterVarsity for 20 years. He was uh, the national, sorry, the regional director for Northeast, um, the East Coast here. He lives in New York. But currently, he is the vice president of campus engagement. And I'll tell you why that is important, why this is important for global leadership. He's probably at the very cutting edge of how the church engages the public sphere. And you've probably heard how Cal State kicked out University, Tufts University down here, uh, Rutgers, and so on. He's, he does that full time, how the church, how this uh, campus group can engage this public sphere. So um, definitely he'll be preaching about it for this uh, uh, chapel, but right afterwards for lunchtime, we need to come and hear some of the, the lessons how Christians can be engaged in that. Let's turn over the time to Greg, and let's give him a hand. It's an honor to be here uh, today. I've sat under the teaching of a lot of students of Gordon-Conwell who've gone out into the mission field. I attend a church right now founded by one. I've said under the teaching of many men and women who've trained here. And so it's an honor to be here. And I have to say, I'm always a little surprised to be standing at a place like this today. Um, because this is not the future I ever planned for myself when I was growing up. Um, I never thought I would be a professional Christian. Um, I'm a second generation Chinese American, so I grew up in one of those Chinese doctor families. So um, 18 of my cousins, aunts, and uncles are doctors right now. <laughs> we can open a hospital, except ironically enough, we don't have an ophthalmologist. Um, and my initial four ways into Christian leadership weren't auspicious. I was a leader at the uh, InterVarsity chapter at the University of Chicago, and the way I was invited to leadership was the selection committee came to me as a sophomore student um, in the spring and said, Greg, uh, we'd like you to be in leadership this coming year. And I knew they were going to come to me, not because of my great leadership skills or my deep spiritual faith. They just, it wasn't a big group. Like, you could count how many was going to be left, right? And so I thought, well, of course you had to come to me. There aren't enough people to be in leaders. But then they said, we want you to be the president, which surprised me a little, but not totally. And then they followed up in the classic socially maladroit University of Chicago way by saying, you need to know before you accept that you weren't our first or second choice, you were the third choice. The other two people have already said no. But before you say yes, we want you to pray about it. Now, I at one point wanted to say, look, if I say no, you're really stuck, there's nobody left. But I thought it was important to pray, and so that launched me to where I am today. I suspect almost all of you have a similar story. Uh, Studying for Christian ministry, whether an MDiv or another master's program, wasn't in the forefront of your mind as you were growing up. And part of what Urbana tries to do is actually propel an entire generation of people to reconsider how does God begin a new thing in a person um, and in culture and in the world? What does, he, what does it take for people to be propelled and invited in God's mission? So the text I wanted to look at today um, is the text of uh, Nehemiah 1. And so if you uh, have, open your pew Bibles, uh, you can have it. It'll also be up on the screen. Nehemiah begins this way, right? In the, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, when I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. 
I want to suggest that God begins a new thing, both in us and propels us into the world when we decide we're actually all in and fully engaged. Because in part, God speaks through minds that are fully informed by reality. What I appreciate about Nehemiah, right, is that he's living in the citadel of Susa. It's the summer capital of the greatest empire in the Middle East at the time. He's sitting in the height of security, in the height of luxury, far distant from anything else that might trouble him, right? It would be the equivalent today of saying, I was living in the middle of the Pentagon, or in Georgetown at Washington, D.C., or if you're from New York, I was living in a penthouse on Fifth Avenue, when he tells you that he's at the Citadel of Susa. It would be easily, easy for Nehemiah to completely isolate himself from the reality of the world around him, because he's at the center of his own little world there. He's at the center of an empire there. He's at the center of comfort and security there. And I want to suggest that there's an incredible danger for us in particularly a social media age where we can selectively choose who we listen to, what we listen to, and what news we get to insulate ourselves from reality just by sheer dent of our own security and success, right? Because if you're living at the center of the empire, it doesn't much matter what's happening at the fringes to you. And I want to suggest that for those of us who, at least while you're here at Gordon-Conwell, are living very close to the center of empire, both the American empire, the educational enterprise empire that um, is here in Western culture, even, frankly, at the center of learning for the evangelical world, it's easy to isolate ourselves there, feel secure there, feel safe there, and remain disconnected from what happens around us. But the reality for Nehemiah and his people are the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down. The reality for Nehemiah as a faithful Jew is that the covenant city of God where he made, he promised his name would be known, where his glory would be revealed, where his people would be gathered, was a two-bit podunk town. Because a city without walls was an indefensible city, a city of no name. And here in the United States, and for most of the developed world at least, we don't have cities with any meaningful walls, right? But the equivalent would be a city with no major league sports team. <laughs> the city without the Starbucks, right? I mean, it's way at the edges of empire. And for Nehemiah, what I deeply appreciate is he didn't allow that to be distant to himself, right? Because the challenge would be that you think of scenes like this, a picture by uh, Sebastio Salgado, as being distant, or something that happens somewhere else. I was at um, the cultural center of the city of Chicago one time, and there was an ex exhibition of these prints by Sebastio Salgado. And I remember a couple walking past me, and these were pictures from the Rwandan genocide, and I was praying, right? My heart was broken as I was remembering what was happening, and all they could say as they walked past was these words, wow, unreal. And I thought, Friend, that's not unreal. That's the daily lived experience of people in the world. That's not unreal. That's profoundly real. It's more real than this weird air-conditioned environment we find ourselves in, looking at these pictures from a distance of years and space and time. God begins in new things when our minds are fully informed by reality, fully engaged with what's happening, where we don't allow things like this to become unreal. God begins to speak to us, I think, and propel us to do new things when our hearts are thoroughly brokenness by the brokenness of the world. What I love about Nehemiah is that when he hears about the brokenness of the walls, when he realizes his people are in disgrace and God's name is being blasphemed because people think if that's the kind of God he is, he can't defend his own city and temple. He must be a pretty worthless tribal God. He begins to respond with prayer and mourning and fasting, not just for a pray quick prayer meeting, not just over a short period of time, but over days, he allows his heart to, begin to be broken by the knowledge that he has. And this, I think, represents his soul saying, I reject the status quo, right? This is not the way the world is supposed to be. Jerusalem should be a place where the glory of God is reflected, not with walls broken down. This is where God should dwell in glory and beauty, not with a temple that's been destroyed and barely rebuilt. This is the place where mission should be moving from the people, covenant people of God, to all of the nations. And at this point, we're a joke people who've been dispersed to the nations with no witness and no power and no hope. 
this is not the way the world should be. And I think when his mind is fully saturated in reality, when he informs himself of what's happening, and his heart begins to break, and it issues forth in prayer, God begins to do something new. I wonder for all of us here at Gordon Connell, how do you allow your minds to continue to be informed by reality and your heart broken by it? I, for example, um, always open my um, browser every morning. Uh, the first thing I do is check out CNN.com. Not because I love CNN and not because I think it's excellent, but I think of it as God's billion-dollar attempt to get me prayer requests on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. But it's easy, isn't it, in our world just to open up your browser to the websites that you like and isolate from yourselves from the voices that you aren't interested in. I think it's one of the reasons that for you as a community, it's critical that we study scripture together. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a second-generation Chinese-American. My parents grew up in the Philippines um, immediately during and after World War II. They know poverty. And so they've spent their entire life working very hard to ensure that their children would never know want or need. Right? I'm one of those suburban Chinese-Americans that you may have encountered. So you can only imagine my parents' distress when I finally announced to them I didn't want to be a doctor. Right? This is third year college. I'd already finished the pre-med curricula. I couldn't tell my dad during Christmas break because that was too frightening, so I drove 30 miles to campus and called him the next day. <laughs> um, dad, I'm not going to finish the last quarter of physics because, and he goes, oh, okay. And I said, because I don't want to be pre-med anymore. And he said, so what are you going to do then? Now, I panicked. I put all my energy into breaking my dad's heart, right, and being okay with not being a doctor. I didn't have a career plan. But I told him the first thing that came to mind, which all my friends had suggested that I do, which was, I don't know, Dad, maybe I'll go to law school. <laughs> to give you a window into my dad's mind and the culture I grew up with, this was his response. You're going to settle for being an attorney? <laughs> How will you support yourself? So you can only imagine his pleasure a day later, or actually a year later, when I said, you know, Dad, I don't even think it's law school. I think I'm called to go work with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life support raising, asking friends and family and churches for money to fund myself. So his response, of course, was, so you want to start begging, do you? <laughs> well, I felt pretty strongly God calling me to InterVarsity, but my dad was clearly opposed and wrestling with it. So I turned to my community and I said, so what do you think I should do? So I turned to my Asian American friends and said, you know, I feel called to go on university staff, but my parents oppose me. What should I do? What Bible verse do you think they began to quote to me? Honor your father and mother, Greg. It's the first command with a promise. It's repeated both in the Old Testament and then reiterated twice in the New Testament so we know it continues to be valid even in the New Covenant, Greg. You should do it. And then they would tell me these stories. Greg, there was this missionary who felt called to go on the mission field. But his parents opposed him, and so out of obedience to Scripture, he didn't go. And it didn't last just days or months or years. Decades the man waited and prayed for his parents to change their heart. On his deathbed, finally his father said, I was wrong. Go to the mission field. And Greg, because he waited decades and honored the Lord when he went to the mission field, thousands of people came to faith because of his faithfulness. Excellent! Then I turned to my non-Asian friends. So what do you think I should do? And they quoted me verses like this. So Jesus came up to a man and said, come, follow me. And the man said, let me bury my father first. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. Anyone who doesn't love right, me isn't worthy of the kingdom of God. And I was like, okay, of course you would say that because the entire Western narrative, right, in every Disney movie and every um, novel is young people, break free from your oppressive parents. Go find yourself. Do what you want. I'm sure that's God. Whereas, right, the Chinese narrative is Mulan. You may disobey your parents, but it's largely for the sake of protecting them. Sacrifice your own identity and your own aspirations so that you can save your parents, right? It looks like the same story, but the motivations are totally different. So what was I supposed to do? I mean, what I wanted to do was like, okay, white people, black people, yellow people, all in the same rooms. We need to look at the scripture. Both of these are here. Right? But it was fascinating to me that if I allowed myself to be isolated by my own culture, or own people who look like me, prayed like me, or think like me, I would have only heard one part of the scriptures. Because in fact, we weave our hermeneutic around our own cultures. So of course Chinese people and Korean people all talked about honoring your father and mother because it resonated with our deeply Confucian cultural roots. 
So that's the passage that's preached every Father's Day. Honor your father and mother. They don't even get to, fathers don't exasperate your children. I'm not always convinced that was translated into those books. I'm sure like, <laughs> textual variant, can't be there. And of course, non-Asians immediately appealed to the Western narrative about development. Break free from the culture that you came from. Do what you want to do, and in your individual choices, you will find freedom and fulfillment. And in fact, what it would take Right. For me, is to bring both of those cultures together, examine the scriptures, and say, I must both honor my father and mother and simultaneously pursue the kingdom of God as the pearl of great price. And until I can find a way to do both, I'm not doing justice to the scriptures. And I'm not indeed following Jesus to where he leads. But until I immerse myself in the reality of the world, until I allow my heart to be broken by its reality, engaged with the people around me, I will never do that. I will be comfortable. I'll find theologies that reinforce my current prejudices. And I'll be insensitive to the actual voices of the world. It's one of the reasons, um, I think, um, at a church that I was an elder at, um, it was an Asian American church, so we all went out to eat lunch afterwards, because that's what you do in Asian churches around the world. You eat together. And I remember we were eating lunch, and my friend Ina said, you know, every time you pray, because I had prayed the pastoral prayer that day, it just bums me out. Why do you pray such depressing prayers every Sunday? Thankfully, we were eating, so I put the burger up to my mouth to buy myself some time. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she said, you know, you got up there on Sunday, and I, we had finished this great worship service, and then you said something like, Lord, we know during this hour and a half worship service, 1,500 people will die of hunger. <laughs> Nine people will commit suicide. Four, you know, 1,000 people will contract HIV. Um, and 850 children will die of a communicable, preventable disease. Lord, have mercy. She goes, I don't need that. You bum me out. I come to Sunday to be encouraged, renewed, strengthened for the week, and then you come up. People are dying while we sing. <laughs> but in fact, what I told her, look, Ina, if I don't pray that reality, at the same time I can sing a song like, your love endures forever, then really Karl Marx is right. Religion is the opiate of the masses. And all I'm doing is encouraging the church to conform to the world's desire that we um, make no trouble, we disturb nobody's peace, and we make no change. I wonder for you folks here at Gordon-Conwell, what would it take to engage the pain of the world? How deeply do we need to listen to those who are leading Black Lives Matter around the country right now to understand the urban realities that it can be so distant from so many of the congregations we might end up with? For those of us working in urban situations, how do we reach out to the margins of our community? What would it mean to listen deeply and intently to the pain of LGBTQI voices? So that as we preach and pray the scriptures, right, as we hold out scriptural standards but also pastoral care, we do so not from a distance or from a theoretical perspective, but actually based off of real life engagement with people. So that the problems that we're answering are actually the real life lived experiences of the people that we minister to. How do we listen to the voices of the global church far more vibrant and grappling with issues far more deeply than we often do here in North America. I think the only way to do that is to engage in mission, right? It's one of the reasons, and here's where I'm going to move to the Urbana por plug portion of this um, chapel moment. It, it is why I love being part of Urbana. Um, it is the missions conference sponsored by InterVarsity. It's designed for people between college age and 29. One of the reasons I love and care about it is because um, for 60-plus uh, years now, it's been a primary mission-sending um, movement in North America. Um, Billy Graham at one point said he thought about half of all U.S. missionaries had had some contact with Urbana as a primary voice of hearing God's call. Because Urbana's goal is to make sure that you hear God's voice in the call to mission, hear the needs of the world from people who are actually engaged in the world, and then hear a clear command to go. Um, one of the things I love about Urbana is that the speaker lineup reflects the world. So the Bible expositor is not yet one more North American encouraging other people to go while they stay and preach, right? But um, our Bible expositor this year will be Patrick Fung, who's the first Chinese person to actually lead what is now what used to be the China Inland Mission, right? After 150 years of China Inland Mission and Overseas Missionary Fellowship reaching Asia, we finally have an Asian director. And he brings a unique Asian 
approach and understanding of the needs of the world and the, what are the themes of scripture that have to be lifted out. And I think North American Christians have to listen to that because the future of missions actually and the future of the church is in the global south and in Asia. Um, uh, Evelyn Reichacher is um, a professor at a competing seminary on another coast, um, but she's a leading Islamicist, right, and works um, in Muslim communities in France. So you will hear from somebody who's working in that context. Alan uh, Matamoros is a Latin American man who spent um, 15 or 20 years of his life working as a Latin American, mobilizing people to work as missionaries in the Middle East as Latin Americans. Right? If we really believe that it's the rest of the world going to the rest of the world, we need to hear those voices as North American. We need to have the diversity of voices, and I love the fact that Urbana does that. Um, there are 250 mission agencies and seminaries that will be at the exhibit hall. So if you've ever thought, I want to know what mission agencies think about something, about 180 of them will be there. You can literally check them all off on your list and ask the questions that you want to ask. Um, there are seminaries there, but you're already here, so you don't need that. Um, so let me move on. Um, God launches a new thing when we decide we're all in, right? Our, heart, our minds are informed, our hearts are broken, we begin to pray. I think God begins a new thing through prayer saturated with knowledge of God. And you all have taken classes in exegesis, so let, I'm just going to read the prayer, and I want you to notice the rich language and understanding of God's holiness, love, consistency, and faithfulness that motivates Nehemiah's prayers in verses uh, 5 through 11. Nehemiah says, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to a place that I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people who you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Grant your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man, Nehemiah prays. Right? Did you notice um, his appreciation for God's attributes, right? His power and his love and holiness, his knowledge of God's character, his faithfulness to what he says and who he is, knowing God's purposes that in the end, God is ultimately jealous for his own glory, and therefore on that basis, Nehemiah begins and begs him to pray, right? Why are we bold in prayer? It's not because we can be louder or more enthusiastic or pound the floor, right? Being bold in prayer doesn't mean you just cry out more loudly or more enthusiastically. We're bold in prayer not because of personality, but because of God's person. We know God's power, but who would pray to an inept, impotent, uncaring God? We know that God's character, who would pray to a capricious God who couldn't be trusted? And we know something about God's purposes. We know he wants to glorify himself. And because we can say, do what you yourself want, Lord. Accomplish your own purposes. We can pray with great boldness, great enthusiasm, and great trust. It isn't about the depth of our faith, right? It's about the greatness of who God is, and we trust him, and therefore we pray. And then from that point out, as Nehemiah saturates himself in a knowledge of who God is, intercession bursts out. In that old great word that people used to use about intercessory prayer, right, there's importunity here. He doesn't just ask in a namby-pamby, like, I hope this is okay with you. Would you do this? But he just begins to demand, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayers of this, your servant. Do this for me. Demanding that God listen because Nehemiah so clearly believes that his prayer is grounded in God's purpose and his character and his person that he has no fear that he has no hesitation, and he has great joy, right? It's why boring prayer meetings, I want to suggest dull, lifeless prayer meetings reflect a vision of a dull, lifeless God. But if you're caught up in the grandeur of who God is, and you're caught up in his purposes, and you realize God is inviting you to partner with him to accomplish these things, 
all of a sudden you begin to prayers, you pray prayers like, give me favor in the eyes of this man. Because I think God launches us to do new things when our minds and hearts are fully informed by reality and our hearts break over it, when we're caught up in who God is and begin to pray. And then I think God begins to do these new things in us when we're put, um, sorry, I should have um, forwarded, um, he begins to put us in a new place by hearing a new situation and, and where we are. Nehemiah ends his section this way. I was the cupbearer to the king. Now, this seems, if you aren't familiar with the culture or haven't studied this text, a kind of odd thing to say, right? Um, so you're a waiter. Wonderful. In fact, most of us pay no attention to waiters. We largely dehumanize them. Um, which is a mistake, but um, right, if you're a cupbearer to the king at this stage in time, and I trust you all know, given your Old Testament studies, um, this means you're an intimate, a close friend to the king because you are responsible for his safety, most likely. Right? You're involved in supply chain management, from making sure that you know where things were locally sourced from all the way until it reaches his lips to ensure that nothing has adulterated and that it's safe. In fact, people who were cupbearers to the king often had the equivalent position of a prime minister or vizier because this is the person the king trusted. And it makes me ask the question, so where has God placed you in a position of influence to accomplish his mission? Um, one of the things... I love about Urbana is that it actually asks that question, right? Um, in our current themes, every life tells a story. Your, your current placement is exactly where God wants to, you to be in order to propel his mission forward. And what you learn there then gets used wherever you go. And so for Nehemiah, who better to ask the king to provide aid for a city that was known for rebellion? Who more trusted by the king who would be more trusted by the king than Nehemiah to say, would you be willing to allow me to raise a temple to a foreign god, to rebuild the walls of a city that you know might turn against you, and to do it well and in a way that advances the aims of empire but also of what God wants? Let me ask for all of you, um, how might God be using where you're at to advance his, world, his mission in the world? Now, obviously, you're all studying for Christian ministry at one level or another, so the answer may seem to be obvious, but here's why I'd love to challenge some of you, especially those of you who've never been to Urbana to come this year. I've talked to a lot of seminary students who've said, I really would never think about going to the mission field. I feel called to the local church. But when you press a little bit more deeply into why, answers tend to be, well, I mean, partially, man, um, fundraising is terrifying. Do you know how much debt I graduate from after a few years at seminary? It'd be impossible. I want to say that if this is your barrier to thinking about mission, if this is one of the reasons you wouldn't consider a career in mission, then you will never be able to call your church to stewardship with any integrity unless you're willing to wrestle with that stewardship question yourself. If your college and university and um, seminary debt is too much for you to think about doing something that might put you financially at risk, you will be unable to call your congregants to live a life of great sacrifice. I've talked to other people who've said, well, you know, I know my calling is here, but unless you give yourself at least one opportunity before God in the company of the community of God to wrestle with, should I be involved in mission? Should I go? You will never have the integrity to look at your congregation in the eye and say, now you must go because the Great Commission is clear because the trajectory of old to the New Testament is God calling a people to send them out. In the end, we will end up preaching um, sermons that are largely about caring for those who are already here, reaching out locally where it's comfortable and safe. Until we wrestle with the possibility of massive dislocation for ourselves, going to a culture where we are powerless, where we don't have the basic skills to communicate or get what we need, we will be unable to enter the world of those who feel powerless in our society to preach to the margins, but we'll always end up preaching to the center. I want to suggest to you, brothers and sisters, your calling may be clear, and if you're headed to a church already, praise God for you, but at least at one point in your life, wrestle long and hard with what would it take to take on a job which would force you to be totally powerless, absolutely financially dependent, and put in a culture where you have no skills or resources, because until you do that, you will be unable to call the church wherever you go to seriously consider doing that themselves. 
and will continue to have churches which are largely about serving themselves, continuing to disciple ourselves, enjoying the riches of living in the middle of empire, and ignoring the needs of the world. Because, in fact, I really do believe if you want to change the church, you have to start with changing the leadership of churches. And that's who you are. But if the leadership of churches would change, then the church would change. And when the church changes and involve, engages in mission, the world begins to change. So at a small level, I invite you to come to Urbana. And in fact, um, we have a $65 off uh, gift for the first 10, I think it's 16 or 10 students, to register. If you use that code, GCT. SU15, uh, right, Gordon Connell Theological Seminary, Urbana 15, at registration, the first, I think, 10 students, it may be 16, who register beginning today, will get $65 off your registration fee. But mostly, let me invite you, wrestle with the call to mission. Allow your mind and heart to be thoroughly saturated by the brokenness of the world and let your heart break and your prayers begin to form. Use your study time here to deepen your appreciation of who God is and what he's about. And then ask yourself, given your unique placement in life as future leaders of the church, how might God have equipped you and positioned you specifically to propel his people to continue to do a new thing? Right? This isn't the future I planned for myself either. What I did after I was asked to pray for um, whether I should be the president is for two weeks I went out to the big ceremonial gate at the University of Chicago and I began to pray for the people as they walked through. I prayed a prayer I learned at Urbana 87, because I'm that old. Um, it was a prayer that um, Bob Pierce, who founded World Vision, used to pray, Lord, let my heart break with the things that break the heart of God. I began to see students walk past. I thought, I know this person is such a partier. They get drunk every Friday night. I end up helping them clean up the vomit in their room. And rather than judging them, I thought, what kind of deep pain must they be experiencing that it would be better to be drunk and vomiting as a way of dulling your pain than dealing with it? Right? The sexually licentious student who lived across the hallway from me, I could hear her having sex every day with her boyfriend. Rather than ask questions about lust, I began to ask questions about loneliness. I'd watch professors walk past, and rather than thinking of them as powerful, godlike creatures who had my future in their hands, I began to think, what must it be like to believe you have to publish or you're going to perish? What desperation must that older faculty member be feeling because they can't get a grant to support their lab and their research and they're wondering where their career is going to go? I saw all the administrators who were largely faceless to me as a student but without whom a university or a seminary does not run and I thought we treat them like automatons, invisible people but they're created in God's image. What about them? And my heart began to break and well 30 years later I find myself captivated by the university, the importance of its mission. As my heart broke my prayers began to change. I got caught up in what God could do. And I thought, I love the university. I believe we have a place here. And I want to be a witness. Brothers and sisters, you have a remarkable opportunity in the years ahead of you. Engage the world. Know God. And then ask yourself, how is God to use you to advance his mission? Thank you. Powerful message, Greg. Thank you so much. Let's all stand for the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you from now and forevermore. Pray these things in your precious Son's name. Amen.